Headline News, I'm David Goodnow. Republican leaders in the Senate say they want more time to lobby support for John Tower. Debate on the defense secretary designates nomination could begin as soon as tomorrow, but a vote may not come until next week. Frank Sesno reports the Bush administration is fighting for every vote. With John Tower's nomination in deep peril, political nerves are fraying, threatening to end the era of bipartisanship George Bush said he wanted. Tower journeyed to the White House Tuesday night to plot strategy with the president and top Senate Republican leaders. The upshot, the confirmation vote will be delayed at least a week so Tower allies can state their case. We want the American people to understand what's happened to this nomination and, uh, it's, uh, and that it is an affront to the president of the United States who was elected last November to make these nominations. No one else was. No one in the United States Senate, George Bush, uh, won that election. So we, we, we want a little time to explain this to the American people. We cannot let this case stand as an example of whether or not power was tried to be wrested from the President of the United States by the majority in the Senate, just for political reasons. Seen as the chief obstacle to confirmation, Democratic Senator Sam Nunn, powerful chairman of the Armed Services Committee. This is getting personal. I think Senator Nunn's been working very hard against this nomination, probably making one-on-one -on -one house calls. Dole charges Nunn had a highly critical document prepared on Tower, but nowhere on the report did he indicate it was a partisan effort. You know, all Democratic senators were urged to read that little summary, which turned out to be a Democratic summary, not a committee summary. And some of them were very disturbed by it because it was all anti-Tower. It was a hatchet job. The late night meeting at the White House came after a frantic day of presidential lobbying. Mr. Bush met with a dozen Democrats. They listened but did not commit. I indicated to him that I was leaning strongly against the confirmation and gave him uh, the reasons for that, which basically have to do with what I have seen as a pattern of questionable judgment. Senator Dole says the president understands the risks but is going to take this fight to the mat. The cost could be high, turning the fresh breeze of bipartisanship the president has talked about into a severe political hurricane that could do lasting damage. Frank says no CNN, the White House. Violence related to Salman Rushdie's book, The Satanic Verses, has apparently reached the United States. Two Berkeley, California bookstores that sold the controversial novel were damaged by Molotov cocktails today. In New York, a firebomb seriously damaged the offices of a weekly newspaper that published an editorial defending Rushdie's work. Authorities are not directly attributing any of the three bombings to the book's Muslim opposition, but President Bush says they will get federal attention. Should it appear that any federal laws have been violated in these bombing attacks, I've asked uh, Dick Thornburg, our able attorney general here, to use all of the resources of the FBI and all other appropriate resources of this government to identify and bring to justice those responsible. Iran's parliament today, the Majlis, warned Britain it will break off relations in a week if London doesn't cool its opposition to the death decree issued for Rushdie by the Ayatollah Khomeini. Rushdie is a British citizen. London immediately rejected Tehran's ultimatum. In the Middle East, Egypt has emerged as a leader in the peace process with Israel. The posture is due in large part to the diplomatic maneuvering of President Hosni Mubarak. John Sweeney reports the Arab world's largest nation has become very important to the PLO. Former Egyptian President Anwar Sadat gained a worldwide reputation as a peacemaker 10 years ago when he signed a peace treaty with Israel. In the Arab world, however, he was ostracized and his country was banished from Arab affairs. All of that has now changed as the Arab nations take the initiative for a peace settlement with Israel. The quiet diplomacy of President Hosni Mubarak played a large part in PLO Chairman Yasser Arafat's historic appearance before the UN in Geneva and his later renunciation of terrorism. It's no longer Cairo alone which is identified with a given peeps process while the other parties are questioning as to the validity of this peace process undertaken by Egypt alone. This has made Cairo the hub of diplomatic activity as evidenced by last week's visits by Soviet Foreign Minister Eduard Shevardnadze, his Israeli counterpart Moshe Ahrens, and PLO Chairman Arafat. It has also boosted the importance of the 40-member office of the PLO in Cairo. We became now a uh, uh, very important headquarter. If you watch that the chairman had at least six up to eight visits since uh, November. It shows how in the mind of the PLO and the chairman of the PLO uh, have a successful view towards the role of Egypt. 
Following the recent Soviet peace initiative, Arafat told a news conference attended by many Israeli journalists that the Cairo meetings were the beginning of indirect negotiations, and the local PLO office is willing to go beyond that. If the Israelis uh, would like to come and meet us here openly, so to us, no problem. Given the staunch Israeli aversion to recognizing the PLO, that is not likely in the near future. But given its unique position in this part of the world and its existing peace treaty with Israel, Cairo is destined to become a venue of great importance in the days ahead. John Sweeney, CNN, Cairo. A curfew is being imposed in Caracas, Venezuela after two days of rioting and demonstrations. Dozens of people have been killed, hundreds hurt in protests over increased gasoline prices and bus fares. Acting in a constitutional provision, President Carlos Andres Perez has suspended movement within Venezuela and the right to leave the country. He said Venezuela's $32 billion foreign debt, uh, combined with a decline in oil prices, is the reason behind the price increases. In Chicago, Richard Daley has the Democratic Party's nomination in hand for the mayor's office, with 67% of the city's precincts reporting in. Daley leads acting Mayor Eugene Sawyer 65 to 34 percent. Daley's father was Chicago's mayor for 21 years. Over on the Republican side, former Alderman Eugene Verdoli, Edward Verdoliak, is waging a successful write-in campaign against two other GOP candidates. Turnout was low in today's primary, especially among black voters. The general election will be held April 4th. An aviation task force has some ideas now on how to make the skies safer, but the ideas don't come cheap. The task force was set up to ensure the safety of an aging fleet of aircraft. Today, it asked the Federal Aviation Administration to issue an order for stepped-up inspections of Boeing aircraft and regular replacement of aging parts. That proposal would apply to more than 1,300 Boeing jets and cost about $600,000 for each plane. Is air travel getting more dangerous, or does it simply seem that way? One thing's for sure, the fear of flying is making a comeback, as Dave Monsees reports. Are they becoming so frequent that the pragmatists are joining league with the phobics over the fear of flying? Bombs, blown out cargo doors, and more have caused a rash of crashes that are beginning to worry those who didn't worry before. We went to pick our, pick our tickets. I did ask that we not be put near the cargo door. Everybody's nervous now going getting on a plane. I have to prepare to meet the man above. Classroom courses to dispel the fear of flying have swollen in the last year. Airline captain David Lindsley teaches students to understand the fear and the airplane. That their fear is very, very palpable. It's, it's every bit as realistic as the worst fears I ever felt flying helicopters in Vietnam, for example. This woman is a senior flight attendant for a major airline. Free travel privileges carried her son more than 100,000 miles. Now he won't fly and she's afraid to go to work. Their voices have been distorted. So I want to wear a flying I want to wear a flying box. I want to die. And how does that make you feel? It almost makes me want to cry now just to hear this, because we don't talk about this. But when I leave to go to work, I know every time I leave the house, there's a the possibility I won't be coming back. There is the perception among many travelers that older airplanes may be less safe. But if well-maintained, they can be virtually indistinguishable from the new. However, there are certain giveaways that hint at the age of a plane. Series 100 models. They and the 200 series, which look alike, can be up to 18 years old. The 300 and 400 series 747s are much newer, with a distinctive stretched upper deck. But airline reservation agents CNN checked with would not say which 747 flights had old or new series models. There are no hard figures on how many more people may be afraid to fly, but airline reservations have not suffered markedly as a result. Despite the concern, flying remains an irreplaceable form of transport. Dave Bonsies, CNN, New York. It's slow going for Oliver North's trial. Judge Gerhard Gazelle sent the jury home early again today to hold a hearing about a dispute over the use of some censored memos between North and his Central American courier. The documents had earlier been released to a private group unedited. North's lawyers have asked Gazelle to throw out the case, claiming prosecutors knew the Christic Institute had the memos, but did not tell the judge or the defense. Immigration agents say they will continue to target certain airline flights suspected of carrying illegal aliens. Officials arrested another 69 people in Los Angeles in connection with a smuggling ring that shuttles undocumented workers to the East Coast. Yesterday, INS officials arrested 79 suspected illegals on the same flight during a stopover in Atlanta. 
Some admitted paying up to $4,000 for the flight, false papers, and a possible job. An Orange County, California man is being tried on charges he purposely ran over and killed a woman. But what makes this murder trial different is that the entire incident was videotaped. Greg Lamont reports. This is Danny Ornelas now. This was the 19-year-old last September 1st when he was drunk and behind the wheel of a friend's car as another friend videotaped him. And it was what the camera recorded that has resulted in murder charges against him. The last frame you will see is Debbie Killalay standing directly in front of the hood, maybe a foot away, staring directly down into the driver's compartment. A look that I cannot describe to you on her face. These are the last few blurry seconds of Debbie Killalay's life. The car plowed into the 37-year-old woman as she walked with her children in an alleyway behind her house. Their screams followed the tragedy. The prosecution claims Ornelas deliberately hit the woman. The defense claims she could have gotten out of the way, but defiantly stood her ground. This videotape is the key in the murder case against Ornelas, evidence the defense admits is powerful. Uh, it's a heartrending thing because you hear screams and things like that and, uh, as a part of it. And I can't pretend that, uh, that it's not difficult to look at, and it is difficult to look at, but it's going to have to be, the jury's going to have to be dispassionate about it after they get over the initial shock. Ornelas was laughing with friends outside the courtroom. He doesn't deny he was driving the car that hit the mother of two, but his defense attorney says because his client was drunk at the time, and since he has never been charged with drunk driving in the past, Ornelas should have been charged with vehicular homicides. Consequently, he will try to convince the jury to bring in a verdict of innocent on the more serious charge of murder. But with the unusual, compelling, videotaped evidence, he admits he's faced with a difficult task. Greg Lamott, CNN, Westminster, California. The nation is getting weather from one extreme to the other. The National Weather Service in California and the Missouri Valley can expect drought this year, while parts of the south may be flooded. Spring runoff will also pose flood danger for parts of the Midwest and the Northeast. Most of the country had more moderate weather today. Here's a look at the forecast. Something big is going down at Sears. Today, we're lowering prices on over 50,000 items in our stores and catalogs. And we'll keep them low. Some radio stations play old-fashioned music. It's a tired old sound. At 97 FM, KMEO, we play refreshing arrangements of your favorites and original songs you'll love. Next to you. For more refreshing music, listen to 97 FM, KMEO. If you paid full price for your carpet, you didn't buy it at Right Carpets. And don't confuse buying an inexpensive carpet with saving money. Only at Wright Carpets do we buy direct from the carpet mills, cutting out the middleman, and pass the savings on to you. Like this heavy plush carpet by Evans & Black with five-year wear, five-year stain warranty. Made to sell at $24.99 a square yard, now only $16.99 completely installed. Come in to Wright Carpets in Tempe. Wright Carpets, the right choice for you. the hard-hitting action at the hoop when the Phoenix Suns take on the Philadelphia 76ers Monday at 5 right here on TV 45.
sluggish is how analysts are describing the American economy at the end of last year. The Commerce Department reports a lackluster 2% growth rate in the gross national product for the fourth quarter. Now, while that report was the worst quarterly increase in two years, the final GNP for nearly 4% for all of 1988 was the best performance since 1984. Economists say the new GNP numbers are disturbing because of the unexpected weakness in trade. The merchandise uh, trade deficit for the final quarter of last year reported today climbed to $32 billion, more than 9% higher than the third quarter. Unless President Bush intervenes, Eastern Airlines mechanics will probably strike come this weekend. Union members are waiting for word on whether the White House will appoint an emergency board to avert the strike. Jeff Levine reports union members are not the only ones concerned. Eastern passengers were departing from Atlanta's Hartsfield International Airport as usual, but would they be able to return as scheduled? We thought about it, but uh, we want to go to Barbados, so we're going to take our chances. Travel agents say that up-in-the-air passengers are protecting themselves by double booking on Eastern and other airlines. The more sophisticated business traveler will double book. Full fare passengers will probably have little trouble exchanging their tickets, while the fate of those holding discounted fares is uncertain. Under normal circumstances, Eastern carries some 80,000 passengers daily. But a contract dispute between Eastern and the International Association of Machinists has dragged on for 16 months, with no resolution in sight. And a strike is all but guaranteed this weekend. Eastern says the union is already engaged in an illegal work slowdown. We have encouraged our people to come to work. We have encouraged our people to be productive, and we will continue to do so. The financially troubled airline is demanding $150 million in cutbacks and concessions from the union. As tensions between union and management escalate, Eastern has hired other firms to maintain its planes in the event of a strike. The company says it won't discuss contingency plans, but clearly intends to keep operating. Eastern's 3,200 pilots have expressed sympathy with the machinists, but it's not clear whether they will refuse to cross a picket line. Pilot spokesman Jack Gray says the airline's safety during a strike is an issue. If you have new hires or people that don't have a lot of experience maintaining the airplane, there's no way for the pilot to necessarily notice there's something wrong with the airplane. The machinists hope the pilots will support them and the public will understand if they go on strike. But as the Friday midnight deadline looms, it appears that many passengers could be grounded by this labor dispute. Jeff Levine, CNN, Atlanta. Tobacco giant R.J. Reynolds is giving up on its smokeless cigarette. The company announced Tuesday it's scrapping a billion-dollar plan to launch the premier cigarette. That's the first major marketing decision by RJR's new owner, Kohlberg Kravis Roberts. Premier raised a stink among the health groups who claimed the company was trying to make smoking more acceptable without addressing health concerns. A late spurt of buying lifted Wall Street to a slightly higher close on a moderate trading day. The Dow Jones Industrial Average closed uh, up eight points to 2258.39. Headline Sports is coming up next, and later on this half hour, Raiders of the Lost Movie Set. Excel has been building and remodeling kitchens in Arizona since 1963. We remodeled over 2,200 kitchens and baths last year. We can replace your tired old kitchen with the clean modern design of Excel Royal cabinets like these for only $29.02 complete or $61 a month. And right now, we'll install your new kitchen absolutely free. Excel kitchen and bath remodeling showrooms are in Phoenix, Scottsdale, and Mason. Come see us. Excel. Excel. I bet you're the new neighbor. Yeah, and I bet you went to Ohio State. That's it. Oh, right. <laughs> My brother went there. Tom Key. Tom Key. He's your brother? Do you like chocolate? Sure. Celebrate the moments of your life. Swiss Mocha. A rich coffee with a light chocolate taste from General Foods International Coffees. Tom had the biggest blue eyes. He still does. Celebrate oh. the moments <laughs> of your life. Hi, folks, I'm Tex Earnhardt. Earnhardt's Dodge, and I guarantee you this ain't no bull. Now, tell them how we make it simple. 
That's right, 89 Dodge D100 pickup, 89.88, and payments as low as $162 a month. How about an 89 Dodge Dakota pickup for $75.95? Payments as low as $125 a month. Remember, these are just some examples. We have over 300 in stock. Remember, that's only at Earnhardt Dodge on Country Club, just south of Baseline. It was the night before Christmas. A murder took place. When the smoke cleared, four people lay dead. Tommy Ziegler was convicted of killing four people, including his wife and parents. For 12 years, he has awaited electrocution on death row. Now it's your turn to decide. Call in your verdict, innocent or guilty. Cast your vote by telephone. David Frost presents the facts in one of the most fascinating real-life murder mysteries. And you are the jury in A Matter of Life and Death. Wednesday at 7 on TV 45. I'm Bob Pasella, Headline Sports. Although it's not the ideal way to hop aboard the Dallas Cowboys ship, having to replace the popular Tom Landry, newly named coach Jimmy Johnson called it a lifelong dream Monday when introduced to the local media. It was an opportunity that I couldn't turn down. It was an opportunity that, that I felt like would be not only one of a lifetime, but a situation that you may never, ever see again. As far as the University of Miami vacancy is concerned, LSU coach Mike Archer, a Hurricane alum, said he's 99.9% .9 certain he will remain in Baton Rouge. Only one game in the collegiate top 25 Monday night. Number five, Syracuse held off Connecticut 88-72. Orangeman guard Sherm Douglas scored 22 points, handed out 11 assists, becoming the NCAA's all-time assist leader. NBA Cleveland won its 21st consecutive game at the Richfield Coliseum. At the same time, opening a five-game lead in the Central Division, Ron Harper hit 426 as the Cavaliers roughed up Detroit 115-99. Best finish of the night was at the Miami Arena. Trailing by a deuce, Rolando Blackman took it to the hoop, got the bucket, was fouled, converted the free throw. The Mavericks hold off the heat, 111-110 in overtime. Boston pulled the stinger out of the Hornets, blowing out to a 112-87 victory. Reggie Lewis banked home 28-15 coming in the first quarter. Chicago handed the Spurs their 12th straight loss. Seattle over Indiana. The Clippers are trying to snap a nine-game skid, and the Suns are battling the Blazers. On the ice, Vancouver by a goal, same for Minnesota. Boston tied New Jersey, and Hartford over the Islanders. Bob Pasella, Headline Sports. If you used to take capsules, the makers of Tylenol have just come up with something better. New extra strength Tylenol gel caps. They're gelatin coated. And compared to capsules, gel caps are 33% smaller with all that extra strength pain relief concentrated into a solid center under a smooth gelatin coating. So gel caps are actually easier to swallow. If you used to take capsules, try new extra strength Tylenol gel caps. It's not a capsule, it's better. Introducing VibraShave, the waterproof cordless shavers by Windmere. Slide on any standard twin blade cartridge, and a new technology vibrates the blades thousands of times a minute to improve razor performance for a closer, more comfortable shave. Go ahead, get it wet. Fully immersible, VibraShave is perfect for a woman's bath or shower. With VibraShave, it doesn't cost a fortune to look like a million. Available at Osco Drug. David Letterman's fans just can't seem to get enough of him, but one in particular may be going a bit too far. Police arrested Margaret Ray again today for breaking into the entertainer's New Canaan, Connecticut home. Yesterday, she was arrested for the same thing and told to stay away. Ray is charged with criminal trespass and marijuana possession. She was arrested last May for driving Letterman's Porsche and living in his house for several days while he was away. We get news now from Hollywood from Dennis Michael. This is Dennis Michael with the Hollywood Minute. Higher education pays in Sevier County, Tennessee, thanks to Dolly Parton. 
The Country Singers Dollywood Foundation has arranged to give a $500 scholarship to any student in the county who applies to the local college. Wedding bells will ring on Designing Women. The character Charlene, played by actress Jean Smart on the series, will be wed in a lavish ceremony shooting this week. It's the most elaborate and costly episode in the show's history. Mary Tyler Moore has another chance to play host on Saturday Night Live. The comedian and actress was originally scheduled in early February, but had to cancel. Moore is now slated to stay up late on Saturday, March 18th. This is Dennis Michael with The Hollywood Minute. A bit more of Hollywood is coming to Florida. Universal Studios unveiled plans Tuesday for a half-billion-dollar state-of-the-art movie and TV production studio to be located near Orlando. The facility will feature ride shows and attractions much like neighboring Disney Studios. Florida Universal Studios is slated to open in May of 1990. Archaeologists are trying to dig up some Hollywood history. Their task is to uncover the set of the original Ten Commandments, filled back in 1923. Dan Blackburn reports the Egyptian city lies buried under the sands of California. These may not be the stone tablets on which the Ten Commandments were written, but beneath these sand dunes does lie the set on which the original movie, The Ten Commandments, was filmed. That 1923 epic still stands as an all-time classic and established Cecil B. DeMille as a major movie director. Building the set also provided work back then for a lot of local townsfolk. Yeah, they paid good money and they, they had their own place to eat out there. They fed you real good. They're good. Only thing, that they didn't stay around long enough. <laughs> When the movie makers were done, they buried the huge set in the sand so that only drifting dunes remained. Now, 66 years later, efforts are underway to recover the city of the Pharaoh. Over the years, probably 60% of the water-soluble material in the plaster has been leached out. But the sand has acted as a preservative, so it's kept its shape. Some of the plaster statues of animals already have been recovered. Others, however, disappeared before the set was buried lions and, and sculptures that were made out of plastic, plaster of Paris, were taken and put uh, in front of people's homes and businesses all around the Southern California. But the Ten Commandments boasted a million dollar set, and a lot of it still is buried. The city of the Pharaoh was about 800 feet wide and about 120 feet tall. There was an avenue of sphinxes which led up to the gates of the city. Altogether, there was about 500 tons of plaster, concrete, statuary in the city of the Pharaoh. Environmentalists say the excavation is not expected to harm the fragile dunes, and workers say that history is being preserved. The Ten Commandments is really a landmark film from that era, and we don't have any of the original sets from that era, any of those great sets, as they're called. This is the only one that remains. These dunes may not be the sands of ancient Egypt, but they served the movie's needs nicely, and now they seem a fitting place for Hollywood's archaeologists to uncover part of filmdom's past. Dan Blackburn for CNN, Los Angeles. And that's our report for this half hour. Thanks for joining us. I'm David Goodnow. Around the world, every 30 minutes, this is Headline News. From Turner Broadcasting System, this is the Headline News Network. Sliced bread, indoor plumbing, lifetime equity. Lifetime equity? Yes. Introducing a better way to get what you want from Remco. It's like renting to own, but with a difference. If you return something, you get credit for the payment you've made. Lifetime equity is only at Remco, where nobody treats you better. Well, maybe mom. If you're afraid to smile because your teeth are stained from coffee, tea, food, or smoking, try Keep Toothpaste. Keep fight stains. Use Keep and keep smiling. Some radio stations play old-fashioned music. It's a tired oh. old sound. At 97 FM, KMEO, we play...